The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Depending on where you're logging in from, one of those will sound just about right. Welcome back to another great episode of our Best Practices webinar series with Seven Signal. I see a lot of you have joined early today. Thank you for doing so. If you would like to, please let us know where you're logging in from. Um, me today, I am back in the office in Cleveland, Ohio. We are joined by our very special guest, Mike Graham. Mike, where are you from today? Coming in from Charlotte, North Carolina today. Awesome. Happy to have you, Mike. And of course, as always, we have Jim Vada logging in from Cincinnati. How are you today, Jim? Pretty good. Good to be here. Awesome. All right, with that, we will go ahead and get started. So we are Seven Signal, the leader in wireless experience monitoring, and we'll explain a little bit more in depth as to what that entails and what our mission is as Seven Signal. But really excited to dive into today's topic. We've gotten a great response for this. Today, we are going to dive into Mike complains about site survey documents. Um, really happy to hear some feedback from the audience today. Um, as always, I am Kelsey Rizzuto, the marketing specialist here at Seven Signal, and gave a little intro introduction to our two special guests, of course, Mike Graham and Jim Vada, who will be joining us today. So with that, we will go ahead and get started here. A few announcements before we begin, just bear with me before we dive into the presentation here. As always, we do partner with CWNP for every single one of our webinars. So by watching these webinars, you are eligible for CE credits. If you are pursuing a certification and are interested in receiving a certificate from us, uh, just drop us a message and we can easily send one over per request. Additionally, we do send out a newsletter every other Wednesday. So if you aren't currently receiving that newsletter and would like to, uh, drop us a note and we can easily register you for that as well. Another note, an announcement here worth mentioning before we move forward, Seven Signal has recently been added to the Synex Corporation's GSA schedule as well. Uh, moving forward here, we do host a product tour every single Friday at 12 noon Eastern at that link, go.7signal.com slash tour. And we'll go ahead and drop that registration in here as well if you care to do so. If you haven't recently joined us for a product tour, highly suggest doing so uh, as there's always exciting updates with Mobileye and Sapphire Eye, especially moving into the new year. Moving forward here, we also post all of our slides to our Twitter account. So go ahead and give us a follow at 7signal. And those slides will also be available later this afternoon. But if you aren't on Twitter and would still like access to that, no problem at all. You all should receive a follow-up email with today's presentation as well. We also post all of our recordings and our archived webinars to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch today's presentation or any of our previous ones, go ahead and subscribe to our channel and you can access those there. And as always, we thank you for attending today. Thank you for following us on our socials and our YouTube um, and stay tuned because you never know when we will give out some seven signal merch to our attendees. Another announcement here before we move forward, really excited about this. We have our first virtual user group of 2021 on Wednesday, February 17th from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, this is a great way for us to link up with industry experts, peers, and customers to really connect on how to elevate and maximize your organization's Wi-Fi performance initiatives. Additionally, we will dive into the Seven Signal product roadmap and we'll be joined by an ROI analyst from IDC. So this is a great way to connect with some of our folks on the technical side of the business, but also diving into some of the financial aspects that affect, affect other areas of your organization. So uh, tell your colleagues, tell your peers, and we will drop that registration link in here as well. All right, 
A little background on Seven Signal, we were established in 2007 in Helsinki, Finland, and we're now located in Cleveland, Ohio. As you can see, we've hit a lot of major milestones along the way in our history that we're really proud of, especially our 14 patents, which goes to show that the technology you see from us at Seven Signal, you're only going to see from us at Seven Signal. So we're here because the digital experience matters. And usually when you have a negative digital experience, it bubbles up to some of the top seven Wi-Fi problems that are giving you poor connection. So to give you a little background as to what makes us so different, if you look at your typical enterprise LAN infrastructure on the right, you've got great tools and technologies already installed on the network, such as your Riverbed, Cisco, Aruba, AppNetta, and more that are giving you really great feedback, really great data. Um, but what we do is we move into a different space, living on the edge of the network, giving you full visibility from the outside in with our product of Mobileye. Mobileye gives you full visibility into the user experience and can ultimately be installed on any mobile device living on the device itself, such as your laptops, your mobile phones, your zebra scanners, your workstation on wheels if you're in the healthcare space. Um, additionally, it can be installed on any Mac OS, Linux, Android, or Windows device as well. Moving forward with that, a lot of us are working from home and we need visibility into our home networks to stay connected to those mission critical activities during the day, regardless of where we're logging in from. With Mobileye, we can give you that perspective as well, giving you full visibility into your home networks. Additionally, we also have Sapphire Eye, which are our sensors for service level quality and RF visibility. And through this combination of Mobile Eye and Sapphire Eye, you're really getting great perspective as to what's occurring in your wireless network that you just can't find anywhere else. All right, thanks for letting me dive into that before we move forward here. But before we begin, we do have a trivia question today that Mike provided to us. And we're gonna go ahead and launch that now. Jim and Mike, can you see this question here? Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. In what year was the original 80211 standard ratified by the IEEE? All right. I see a lot of you dropping your answers in now. I'll give you a few more seconds here. And let's go ahead and see how we did here. Mike, how did we do? Wow. Everybody did really good on that one. Uh, it was indeed 1997. Awesome. Great job to everyone who participated. Thank you for doing so. We're going to go ahead and kick off today's topic. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the controls to Mike here so he can begin. Great. Thank you. So before I get started, I wanted to... Uh, give just a little bit of background uh, here. I, uh, whenever we, uh, or one of our customers, did that not go into share mode? Not yet, I just hid the uh, poll results. I don't see your screen yet. There we go. Did that do it? Yeah. All right. Oh. If I can just figure out how to make the, web viewer go away <laughs> all right uh, before we get started uh, usually whenever one of our customers wants to do a sapphire i install we'll ask for a copy of uh, their site survey for the area that we're going to be going in and we'll take a look at that and make a recommendation on how many sapphire eyes are required and and where to install them uh, so we look at a lot of site survey documents. Um, and one day I was, I was kind of complaining about, you know, the quality of some of them that we see. Uh, and I said something like, oh, we should do a, uh, <clears throat> do a webinar. Mike complains about site survey documents as sort of a joke. And everybody said, what a great idea. So, uh, so I'm afraid that I ended up having to do one of these. Uh, and I tried to add a, a little bit of, you know, maybe what should be there, what do the different audiences need uh, content to uh, to make it more than just just me complaining. Uh, and I 
first started by saying, well, what are the different audiences for a site survey document? Uh, and we're really mostly talking about a physical on-site, you know, what I sometimes call a shoe leather survey where somebody actually comes out to the site and either does an AP on a stick or uh, does some kind of active survey with the existing network. Um, and, and I really came up with three audiences for those documents. The, uh, the first one being uh, the installer, usually maybe a cabling contractor or an electrician that's going to do the, the mounting. And I have a little bit of experience in that, uh, more on outside point to point than on, on indoor Wi-Fi, but I think a lot of it translates. Um, and then the second two audiences were uh, the corporate IT department of the customer, the people that are going to own and maintain the network long term. Uh, and then the third one, I also have some experience in, that's third party vendors that are going to be installing some equipment to uh, use your network. And that might be somebody like Seven Signal, uh, where we're going to employ, uh, deploy sensors. Um, if it's a warehouse or manufacturing, that might be uh, robots that are going to be connected to the Wi-Fi network. Uh, in a hospital, um, it could be uh, voice over IP phones or Wi-Fi enabled uh, patient care equipment, uh, that sort of thing. But all of them are going to need to know a little bit about your network to ensure that they can deploy their system in your environment. Um, so I started with the, the installers, usually the first person that's really going to dig down and thought about what do they need to do their job to deploy them. Um, and I came up with, you know, obviously they're going to need to know the location and where the access points are going to be installed. Um, and really that's going to come down to several things. And I know this seems a little bit redundant, but you know, first, obviously, a, a drawing or a map of the facility showing the location, um, a description of where it is outside of Office 318, you know, above shipping dock door 13, something like that. Uh, and then, and this is one that really I think is very valuable, photographs of the location showing where it's to be installed. Uh, and finally, and I, I eventually decided this was actually sort of part of the documentation, uh, a way of marking that location. Um, long ago, whenever I did do site surveys, our company had these three by five fluorescent yellow stickers with our company name on them uh, that we would put up. But you know, you could really use those fluorescent marker dots or something like that to, to indicate the position for the installer during the survey. And I know a lot of, uh, a lot of site surveys, uh, site surveyors do, do put those up. Uh, beyond that, uh, a mounting method. And usually if it's an indoor carpeted space, that's going to be a clip on to a suspended ceiling rails or, or screw into a sheetrock ceiling or something like that. Uh, outdoors, there may be enclosures or, or something like that, but it should describe the mounting method for the access points, uh, drawings of it, annotated photographs, uh, and most of the AP manufacturers provide pretty good detail. Um, I know Cisco has got tremendous amounts of documentation on, on how to install, physically install their access points that can be included in an appendix in that. Um, most are going to want to know where the nearest wiring closet is, or, or if it's not the nearest, maybe a specified wiring closet with a map showing the location and a description. Um, if they're going to be installing them, they're also probably going to be physically labeling those devices. So you may want uh, your device name um, applied to the device with a sticker, maybe the contact information for the IT department, those sort of things. And then a list of other requirements that the installer should collect whenever they are installing it. 
So things like the model number of the access point, the serial number, the MAC address, perhaps photographs as installed for that long-term documentation for the IT department. Um, you have anything uh, on those, Jim? I know that you've you've actually kind of been the corporate IT guy. Um, any other things or any comments on what an installer might need? Well, I I, I love the uh, including photographs of each of the APs in the physical space, either where they're going to go or or where they were installed. So, because there's always that question about, you know, hey, I I put an AP on a floor plan here, but the installer that you know shows up with the you know with the ladder and the AP might find there's all this other stuff already on the ceiling there, or there's some reason why I can't go exactly there. And they may decide, well, I'll just put it, you know, in this area somewhere, and it might be around a corner that, you know, actually has a significant effect on the AP's coverage cell. So having those photographs is really valuable, you know, on both sides of the coin there. Yeah, uh, I agree. There's, there's, you know, nothing like a, a photograph and telling your installer what you, uh, what you need before uh, he gets out there to install it is certainly kind of streamline things and and reduce having to go back and collect some of that information. And if you can put that in the document for the installer. Um, you know, and, and maybe even break out uh, really almost a separate document uh, specifically to address the installer's requirement. I think that's that's really helpful because the installer, he isn't gonna care at all about channel plans or signal strengths or any of that. Uh, he really wants to know where to put it and what else do you need me to do? Um, moving on, well, Moving on. Um, I then look at the kind of the other parties that I thought would be, you know, really using that document. And originally it was two slides and, and they, they basically had had the same items on them. So, you know, this is really more of a long term uh, audience, the the IT department that's going to own that system. Uh, third-party vendors that I mentioned before, what are they going to need to see for that long term? Uh, and really, the the first two are the same that the installer uh, is going to need. You're going to need to know where it is, uh, and you're going to need to know what wiring closet uh, it's connected into. Uh, and of course, with the wiring closet, if you can give more details, specific switches, specific ports, yeah, that's great. But just knowing that it's in a particular wiring closet and you know not the one down the hall is is really helpful for that long term support. Uh, and then really you get into things that that the installer doesn't need, doesn't care about, but the IT department will and third party vendors will. Um, and the first of those is an explanation in the document of what the design parameters were, and it's something that the surveyor should have worked out um, with their customer before the survey you know there's and, and we're not we're not really trying to discuss how to do a survey or any of that but just just what needs to be documented um, and that's those design parameters so you're going to discuss with your with your site survey vendor uh, what those design parameters are is there a signal strength that you need for cell boundaries for for really coverage in all of your areas is there a specific signal to noise ratio you know is there uh user density considerations are you doing conference rooms or you know public facilities that potentially are going to have very high user densities where you're you're not just worried about providing enough signal you're worried about providing um sufficient uh, number of access points to support all of those users. Uh, performance parameters that you need to hit. Do you need a certain amount of throughput? 
you know, are you running voice or video and need to ensure certain latency or certain packet loss? Uh, are there particular applications that you need to be designing for that your surveyor needs to take into account? Is it a purely data network? Are you going to be running voice and video across it as well? You know, maybe it's maybe it's just an Internet of Things low throughput network that uh, that doesn't have um, very stringent performance requirements. But whatever those are, they really need to be documented as part of the um, as part of the original design document. Uh, and then finally, you really need to know what areas each individual access point is going to be providing service in. Uh, so we're back to a map of that area um, and, and a description of that area. So uh, if you can come in and say, you know, this access point or this group of access points provide coverage to the loading dock area or to the, um, to the break room area, uh, that can only help that long-term support. You know, if somebody calls up and says, hey, there's, there's a, problem in the loading docks. Well, which access points are, are designed to be providing coverage there? Which ones do I need to look at? And Jim, I know this is something that you have long experience in that I don't, is yeah. that long-term IT network guys supporting a uh, an ongoing network. Uh, what do you think about things a survey document needs? This is, yeah, I, I could fill up the rest of the time just talking about this slide, but I'll try to be brief. I think you really have to be clear as an organization who is paying someone to do a site survey, what the purpose of the site survey is, right? So a lot of times, um, often the case is, we've got a Wi-Fi problem in our organization, we don't know how to get to the root cause, but we know that probably the first step is doing a site survey and we don't have the expertise or the time to do that. So we'll hire somebody to do a site survey and just tell them we want a site survey. So they'll go do one and a site survey literally is just walking the area, collecting the, the RF measurements uh, and storing them in Akahau or Air Magnet or, or, or whatever you're using. Um, but really, in that case, what, what the, the organization needed was a advanced troubleshooting engagement that maybe led to a redesign, probably needed a site survey. Uh, but that's, you know, that knowing up front what the, the purpose and, and outcome uh, of the engagement is, is supposed to be really kind of changes the whole um, way you, you approach it. And I think that's why, I think it's Sam Clements has advocated that we shouldn't even talk about site surveys anymore. We should talk about doing designs, redesigns, validation, or troubleshooting, those sort of things. So the site survey is a component of that, but it's a little bit like, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like showing up, um, showing up at a hospital and saying, you know, I need a, I need this uh, uh, procedure done, and I need, I need this drug prescribed, without actually going to the doctor first and having an expert say, oh, this is what you know, these are the symptoms. This is probably the underlying root cause, and here's how we'll proceed. So, uh, so if all of that is kind of taken care of at the outset, then you probably have a good, uh, you know, a good um, deliverable. Uh, from the person doing the site survey. Um, and I will say, you know, there's kind of different audiences. The management level, they want to see a nice green map showing coverage everywhere. I would like to, I, you know, which is important, but, you know, coverage is the easiest thing to accomplish, right? I, I, I would say, you know, augment that with a, a map that shows um, what's sometimes called network health or things like that, kind of a single view that shows if everything is within requirements or not within requirements uh, uh, in certain areas. Uh, and then the engineering audience, 
certainly would need a map that would show um, the uh, the channel and transmit power plan for each AP. Um, and if that's not a static plan, then the you know suggested RRM parameters, the min max CX power, things like that. You know, as well as specific um, maps about co-channel interference. Um, and um, and and also maps that show, you know, coverage compensated for uh, you know certain devices that maybe have, you know, insensitive radios that are really important. Maybe you have a VoIP handset that's that measures um, RSSI 10 dB below your survey instrument. Well, how about you just present a map that actually shows. Um, that signal strength uh, adjusted to account for that. Um, so you can get a view of something close to what a, a, um, a client would see. You know, the for the engineering audience, I think the more data you can provide, the better. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that uh, that about different devices having different sensitivity, we, we see that all of the time. Uh, especially looking at things like the data rates in Sapphire, uh, or even with Mobileye, where we track the data rate of the clients. Um, and, and you may think that you've got, you know, wall-to-wall -wall slamming coverage through your, your whole facility with strong signal strengths, uh, and yet we see devices running, you know, at, at very low MCS indices, um, we see indicated signal strengths, you know, well into the mid neg 70s, say, and, and you thought that you had a, you know, negative 65 or better with overlapping coverage everywhere. Um, so yeah, taking into account those devices and documenting uh, how you did that, um, I think is, is, is a really important feature of any survey and, and of the documenting that survey. Um, moving on, a few things that, that are, are just so frequently missing, and photographs are kind of my pet peeve, uh, because I don't know the facilities. You know, at least the IT guys, they sort of know the facility. They, uh, they understand the environment. Uh, Third-party vendors, they've never been there. It may be on the other side of the world. Um, I can remember looking at a, a site survey and there was a, a big slashed area running through the middle of the drawing. And, and I'm looking at it going, well, is it a hallway? Is it a wall? You know, maybe it's, you know, two buildings and that's some kind of a join line. What is that? Um, you know, can I put access points or in my case, uh, can I put sensors there? Um, and, and after I did so, the customer came back to me and said, well, you know, that's actually an atrium running the whole length of the building and we can't put things there. Uh, and there was nothing on any of the drawings. There was nothing on the site survey documents to indicate what that was. Uh, so the, the local guys knew, but the third party vendors, they would have no idea what that feature was on the building. Uh, whereas just a few photographs, um, you know, and I've picked a couple of examples from surveys that people sent me that uh, that were actually, um, you know, I think done very correctly. They they show where the access point goes. They're they're far enough back so that you can see the environment. Uh, you know that the one on the left that that's semi outdoors. Uh, you know, you know that it's wide open. Um, the one on the left, you know, very typical carpeted office space, suspended ceiling. You kind of know what's going on there. If you're a third party and, and you're trying to determine if your application is going to work in that environment, those photographs are, are just gold uh, versus, you know, just a drawing of a big rectangular box where you really don't know the environment. Um, yeah, photos are really key to everyone involved, and you know, especially uh, people doing the design work that maybe weren't able to do a walkthrough or, you know, don't have a good feel for the the building. 
they really mostly just have a floor plan and a floor plan is not a ceiling plan. So it doesn't tell you, do you have a nice open drop ceiling or do you have a four story, you know, opening in, in a lobby area and, you know, but which certainly limits where you can put APs. So, um, you know, photographs really help answer those questions they and do. kind of, yeah, really provide certainty as to where APs were placed. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, most of the survey tools uh, now include some sort of feature to insert photographs into the uh, end of the documents. So uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, I think that's the case now is it's a pretty common feature. I think so. Um, the other one, coverage maps. I see so many that look like this. You know, everything's green, life is good. Uh, and I kind of understand why. Uh, I actually had a friend that um, worked for a major, you know, Fortune 100 company, um, and he did predictive site surveys. And mostly we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, on-site surveys here, but um, he would do the survey or he would do the prediction and, you know, put in all the walls and figure out where all the access points went. And then he would twiddle the parameters so that he would get maps that look like this. And I'm like, dude, why are you doing that? You're, you're losing really all of the coverage information on that. And he came back and said, well, that's what management wants to see. If there's any yellow on the map, they're going to reject it. So he would adjust the, the, the levels that the maps indicated until they looked like this because that's what his boss wanted to see and it just doesn't tell you very much you know yeah you've got coverage there but that's about it something like this and this is not real this is just something that i sketched in is so much more valuable where you do see those hot areas you know where you're you're in the negative 50s or or negative 40s right around the access point and you know, where you're at lower signal strengths and, and those areas that that are weaker, because you know they're there. You know, no no real design looks like that. Uh, Wi-Fi just doesn't work that way. Coverage is never that even. Uh, and I'm sure you've probably seen in this, this kind of thing as well, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the all green map is a, is a it's sort of a way to kind of hide all the intricacies and um, you know the challenging parts about Wi-Fi. It, when it's you know graded by RSSI, then you really kind of get a feel for actually the compromises and challenges of that the real design work and uh, the decision making that went into that. And sometimes you know we don't want to. We don't want to expose that uh, to the end end user, but uh, we certainly should. So, for example, this is a perfect a perfect example of why we don't want to put all the APs in the hallway because our best signal <laughs> strength this is going to be in the Are hallway. Are you on the side here, Jim? <laughs> yeah the the previous map didn't didn't uh, didn't allow you to get a feel for the fact that this design actually gives the best cover or best um, SNR rather to clients in the halls rather than in the rooms. It does, and yeah, this is this is not a good design, and and certainly I'm not suggesting that you do designs like this. Um, although long ago, uh, when requirements were much smaller, uh, and all anybody wanted to do was check an email once uh, once in a while. These designs were actually pretty adequate. You know, they were easy to install, um, but requirements from the network are, are so much different now that this is not what you want to do. But it was easy for me to sketch out, so. Definitely. <laughs> um, moving down, I mentioned this a little bit on the, uh, the installers, uh, you know, flagging those locations. And I actually pulled this from a, a site survey report. Um, and I think this is where somebody did the right thing. They took 
some of those fluorescent markers that you can buy in, uh, you know, really office supply stores, and they're used for tagging, you know, folders by content and that sort of thing. Uh, and and you can put those up before you take the where does the AP go uh, photograph, um, so that your installer really really has a, a a good sense of of where to do that and. You know, I, I mentioned before that well, we're we're, you know, we're describing the location, we're showing it on a map, we're marking it. Isn't that overkill? Um, and just to tell a little little story from long ago. And this was this was a rooftop, um, and we were doing, or I was doing what you shouldn't do, and was shooting a point to point link between two buildings. Um, but sometimes that's that's the only way you can do it. But it did mean that the location of the radio was very critical. We had to line everything up just right to hit that, that line of sight. And I described the location, west wall 10 feet from the northwest corner kind of thing. I took a can of fluorescent spray paint and marked the location. I took a photograph of the location and the contractor still installed it in the wrong place. So after that, I don't think there is overkill on, on documenting where access points go. Um, you've probably seen that as well, Jim, where, where contractors just don't do what you expected them to do. Yeah, yeah, you think exactly. You, you put the green dot, you, you take a picture, and you know maybe they have their own kind of here's how we hang ap's method and they they don't understand you know how critical it is to have a very precise location the actual uh orientation of the ap is really critical as well so uh you know it's it's certainly something that you grows as you work with an installer that you know your expectations and and uh what what you are asking from them but in general you know one way that might help you know head that off is is just to tell them look this is where i need everything to go if for some reason that can't happen or you think there's we should do it a different way then i have to sign off on that change before you do it which yeah. could just be, hey, call me, send me a, you know, text me a picture of what you're looking at and where you, and, and let's have a conversation about where you want to move that AP. Um, because it is frustrating for sure to discover that kind of stuff after it's been installed and then have to have rework done and, and have uh, delays and things like that. Yeah, sometimes it can really matter to, if, you know, if the uh, survey technician had, had taken into account, you know, there's a, a massive support column here and, and we want to be on one side of it versus the other side and it gets moved. That can, you know, just a few feet can make a really big difference in, uh, in the way the network works, uh, especially if they were, you know, taking advantage of the building structure uh, to, to get the most efficient coverage or to isolate access points from each other or something like that. So, uh, I don't think there is such a thing as over documenting on that. Um, and then Jim mentioned a few few of these in uh, in uh, discussing sort of what the the corporate needs to see, but most of the softwares offer other visualizations other than coverage or SNR, um, and, and some of these are predictive, and some of these are are measured during uh, the survey uh, as they walk around the building. Um, you know, things like airtime utilization and uh, which, which access point you're gonna associate to or how many clients are, are expected on each AP, coverage overlap, data rates, you know, all of these kind of things. Um, and they're useful, but there's a few things that I think uh, keep in mind is, Anything that, that's sort of an active um, measurement where you look at 
airtime utilization during a survey, you know, obviously not a greenfield survey, or you look at the number of users associated on an access point or, or things like that, uh, really most of these, you know, you're looking at a very narrow time slice there. It, it's, it's what it is right now. And, and one of the things that has become really apparent to me, especially looking at our Sapphire data, where we're, we're taking samples every few minutes of the, the uh, environment 24 seven and 365. So we see a, a really long uh, stretches and, and all of these uh, are really moving targets. You know, utilization on the network, number of people on an access point, all of these things change really dramatically uh, over time. Um, and things like, you know, what channels, and, and I love the, the drawings, especially in 2.4, but also in, in 5 gigahertz when you're using wide channels and, and don't have a lot of channels to use. Uh, those maps that show what channel is covering a particular area so that you can, you know, perhaps adjust and, and uh, reduce the, uh, the overlap. Uh, those are valuable, but you really have to remember that those are also really moving targets that, you know, day to day and week to week, uh, they're going to change. And even, even signal strength is really going to change, um, you know, not just on the basis of, of RRM or, you know, in a warehouse, you sort of expect it to as, as product moves around and moves in and out that, that the propagation characteristics are going to change a little bit. Um, but sometimes we'll be looking at the received signal strength of an access point, and all of a sudden it'll change 15 dB. You go, wow, that's a really big change for, for some kind of automated power management to make. Did something else happen? Did a fire door close? Um, so while these are valuable, they're definitely moving targets. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, a um, couple, couple, couple thoughts. The uh, like the data rate and um, throughput and and those kind of active performance measures that you talked about, those are really client specific, and they're really uh -huh. impacted by that client's roaming performance too. So what you see with a uh, a site survey. Um, uh, you know, a site survey uh, instrument that's attaching to the Wi-Fi and actively testing it. To me, it's it is a it is it does validate um, that a this client at least works very well. It doesn't really tell you what's going to happen with the rest of your clients, so don't uh, don't give that you know more weight than it it has. But also definitely a, a good reminder that site surveys are a single point in time and Wi-Fi is really dynamic, it's changing every day, every hour, every minute. And so, uh, you know, tools like ours, you know, are, are a great way to kind of fill in the gaps of visibility of site surveys. Um, but I, you know, for me, again, I, I love all the extra visualizations you can get. And if it feels like, you know, you're, you're presenting too many, you can put them in a little, you know, put them in an appendix, put the important stuff in the first 10 pages. And then the, you know, the, the other 20 visualizations put in a, an appendix just in case they want to see them. Yeah. And, and actually that's, that's something that I didn't put in here that, that I think applies is, really you don't deliver site survey documents on paper anymore um i know back long long ago when i used to actually do a lot of surveys and this that was before really echo how or uh, land planner or any of these tools existed uh, and it was graph paper and colored pencils and, and then translating it you know in, in visio or something we we would deliver them um on a cd so once again you know it's been a while uh, and we would also print out you know 
it was an expensive service. So we would we would print the uh, the document on nice paper and put it in a three ring binder and label it and and ship it to the customer. Um, and they were massive sometimes. I mean, you know, site survey would be an armload. Um, but really, you're not doing it on paper anymore. Uh, there is no reason to try to shorten the document. Uh, go ahead and include appendices. Uh, go ahead and include a access point specific comments on that. Um, you know, it, it's a file now. It, it's it's not like somebody has to carry it around physically. Um, anything else, Jim? Uh, no, I don't think so. Should we jump to uh, Q and A? I think so. All right. So a couple a uh, couple good comments and questions have come in so far, and I want to invite anybody. Uh, in the audience who has something to say to, to uh, share your complaints with us too. Uh, good comment here from Mark, who uh, this is just an observation. Through dictating methodology of mounting, there is a potential for liability crossover in the event of structural failure. Who's responsible? Consultant who d dictated self-tapping uh, screws or engineer who followed that direction? My personal stance, uh, says Mark, is that mounting orientation and bracket type should be dictated as part of the survey, but actual mounting methodology and fixings to be utilized should be left to the guys uh, on the tools. I think he means guys with the tools, probably the on-site installers. Uh, any any comment there, Mike? Um, yeah, a couple. Um... Definitely the guys on site with the tools, um, they do it every day. Uh, they really do have a lot of expertise in, in how to do that. And, um, you know, I'm not going to underestimate their skills at all, but um, I know that whenever, you know, if it was something I did, we would often, you know, actually specify things like safety cables attached to the structure of the building just because of those those liability issues. And we would include that as part of how to install it is, is you know, frequently we actually would, especially if it was something bigger than your basic, you know, plastic case access point, um, we would we would specify pretty well engineered very safety conscious installation methods. Um, so it's shared responsibility. Um, and, and certainly the the installers, if they have some concerns, they need to be encouraged to bring those forward. Yeah, it's a good comment because uh, some access points have gotten heavier and heavier as the years have gone on. And uh, I was thinking structural failure, like what the the wall falls over because you put an AP on it, but actually, you know, and <laughs> I can easily see in some cases an AP uh, falling from its installed location and potentially causing personal injury. Uh, and uh, Mark just followed up with, I I've seen a few suspended ceilings drop. Yeah, I, I certainly believe that with uh, some of the, the big uh, uh, APs that are out there these days. But I agree, you know, um, that's a tough call. You know, the installers are the ones on the ground that have the experience, but also, you know, there's probably, Mike mentioned Cisco, there's probably, you know, vendor specified uh, installation methodologies that are supported. So, yeah, uh, hopefully there's, uh, hopefully Mark, you've never been burned by a liability concern there. Um, uh, question, uh, another good question here. Uh, I mentioned, um, you know, doing device offsets in uh, site survey documents. And a uh, question here, what offset uh, should we select for an AP on a stick site survey? You know, I don't know that it really matters if you're doing AP on a stick or um, a predictive uh, design or, or um, doing, you know, uh, measurements with a site, site survey instrument. I think what matters is that you're you're sort of using an offset that matches the the 
the LCMI, if you will, the least capable, most important client on that um, in that WLAN. So if you're doing voice over Wi-Fi, it's probably that voice handset that you want to really uh, be uh, most critical about. And uh, a good resource there is a website called rssicompared.com uh, where uh, people have crowdsourced those offsets, those measurements of device uh, differences uh, to give you uh, uh, an idea of what, you know, uh, what, uh, what a device actually looks like offset, say, from like a Echo House sidekick, for example. So really handy resource there. Yeah, it is. Do you, uh, Jim, do you kind of know sort of, I haven't looked at the site, what order of magnitude? Because because I've certainly seen devices that are 10 dB apart in, in the same area. Yeah, I think, you know, 10, 12 dB is not, um, is not uncommon. Um, so I'll drop that link here in the public queue. Q&A that Lex uh, just asked for, so everybody can check that out. But it can be a pretty massive difference. So definitely keep that in mind. And, and the difference, uh, I mean, 10 dB is a big number. Uh, it really is. Um, you know, and just on signal strengths in general, um, I know that the difference between, say, negative 65, which is a pretty common sort of cell boundary, uh, if you will, and, you know, negative 55. Uh, if you go look at data rates, and, you know, I, we spend a lot of time looking at, at that, uh, it's huge. The, you know, you're not going to achieve those, those high-end uh, N or AC or AX data rates uh, with negative 65, right? If you need those higher throughputs, um, you're going to have to really put a lot of signal down. That's right. Absolutely. So, okay. I think that about wraps it up. Uh, Kelsey, I think we're, we're all good now. Awesome. Well, thank you to all of you who dropped those questions in the chat here. Really great discussion. We love hearing feedback from the audience on these topics every week. And just want to give a huge shout out to Mike and Jim. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Always happy to have you. And thank you to all of our attendees for giving us 45 minutes out of your workday to really dive into this. So have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you at next week's webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jim, thanks Mike. Bye everybody. Thanks Mike, see you Kelsey. Bye guys.